Uh, a very good evening to you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, for those of you who want to have a Portuguese translation, there are ear, ear plugs out there, and we shall conduct this meeting mostly in English. Ladislao, who is Brazilian, is, speaks better English than I, so uh, if you do need it, they're out there. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much for probably what is a long day. So we shall try and make this as interactive and as exciting as we can. And uh, we have some panelists who are stuck in traffic, um, but we do have a very distinguished um, pair, uh, eminent thinkers and practitioners in this space for you. Um, we have Professor Ladislao Dauba. And he is professor of economics at the sister university of this university in Sao Paulo. Um, and uh, Ladislao was recommended to us because apparently he has the inside track on, on uh, Brazilian finance and politics and is a, has the ear of many Brazilian politicians, uh, we were told. So um, it's tremendous to have Ladislao here. And also, I was very attracted to his work because he has written on a phrase which I find particularly interesting, which is economic democracy. Uh, so hopefully we'll hear a little bit about that in the context of what we want to describe. Um, we also have uh, Stephen Stone, uh, who is the chief of the UNEP's economics and trade branch. And uh, Stephen is one of the architects of the uh, green economy initiative work, the TEAB work, uh, really an architect behind a lot of the thinking that is both uh, challenging um, civil society and these conferences, but also offering ways forward. So uh, great to have Stephen with us. Stephen is a, a long-time supporter of the Green Economy Coalition. Um, so I'd like to introduce myself. Um, my name is Oliver Greenfield, and um, it is remarked that my name is perfect for my job. Um, it, it was not always that way. I was once called Oilfield, but um, I saw the light. And... Um, so we have, and the Green Economy Coalition, uh, and I think that I'm able to just put a couple of pictures up. Um, does that work, Mr. Technology person? Where do I go now? Where have they gone? It's precisely when you need them. They have disappeared and put pictures of me, which I can already see and you can already see. Um, we're on a different channel, are we? Anyway, um, very nice to... Oh, we're on. Okay, thank you. Where's that? Okay, so as you can see, uh, the rest of our panel are stuck in the traffic of Rio de Janeiro. What does that say for a green economy conference? Um, something. So I'd like to just give you a little bit of background about um, the Green Economy Coalition. And I, I guess I, I'm, I know a few faces in the audience, and some of them are from our coalition members themselves. Um, but just to give you a little bit of background, in 2009, um, a number of those different organizations, I wish I could stand up and walk around a bit, it's not enough energy. Can I project? And can you still hear me? Uh, right. Can I have one of those? Yeah, I, I, let's bring a bit of energy because it's been a long day. I need to stand up. Okay. Um, so in 2009, Quite a few different organizations that have been in environments and development, individuals in those organizations starting to get a sense that sustainable development may be stalling, that the trends are going in the wrong directions, that the environment is still degrading at an accelerating rate, poverty is persistent, and there is growing inequity. So individuals in those organizations starting to say, maybe there's something around re-engaging sustainable development? What is the cause that sustainable development is still not seen as a priority for many of the governments around the world? And many of those organizations came to conclusions that one of the reasons was that sustainable development was always down the priority list when at the top of the priority list was economics. Growth, jobs, taxation, public spending. The question that was then posed was, by a lot of those organizations was how do we term sustainable development much closer in those economic priorities? And that was the question. And at that point, UNEP really um, took a very much a strong leadership role and said we are going to put 
a lot of time and investment into the green economy concept. The concern that many of these organizations had was that if that term was determined only by UNEP or by other governments, that it would not truly reflect environmental improvement. It would not truly reflect addressing poverty. Whoa, where's the fuzzy gone again? Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so, so we started to work together, and our first phase was really about learning and sharing um, about the green economy. What does this term mean to people? Is it a threat? Is it an opportunity? And certainly if we're not inside that, helping to determine it, it could be very narrow, could be not delivering sorts of transformation. So with our partners IIED and others from this global group, we started to have dialogues in countries and starting to get a sense of what does this term mean for you? Um, and a lot of the questions came through. What is this different to sustainable development? Why are you talking economy? Is this the commoditization of nature? Those issues have always been there. Um, our idea was to bring that discussion up, really to articulate it and, and to make sure that we were starting to address some of those issues collaboratively and not by governments, not by business, not even by UN, but by civil society having that discussion. So that was our um, formation period of 2009. Um, and we really came up to this, I don't need that now, we really came up to this point of having um, a shared analysis that environmental conditions are getting worse, um, poverty persists, inequalities continue, and that this was not being enabled by sustainable development, um, that we should look for a vision of prosperity for all within planetary limits and that would be enabled by a green economy. Uh, and therefore, to accelerate a green, fair and inclusive economy, I think we came up with the inclusive a long time before the discussion did. We recognized that it had to be about civil society engaged, civil society actively defining this, implementing it and making sure it was authentic to different social and environmental conditions around the world. Um, now, just to continue the story, we went to the um, UNEP Governing Council in Nairobi in March, and we turned up and we were there to try and help civil society engage in the discussion of green economy. Um, and there was a, a plenary session with, I don't know, uh, 500, 600 people there. And in that session, was very clear, we still don't know what green economy is. We therefore feel like something is being pushed on us. We're not comfortable with it. Why are you doing this anyway? Isn't this, what's wrong with sustainable development? All of those discussions came up. And so our point was, and the question came very clearly, what, are, what is a green economy? What are the principles that govern it? And so we said, well, okay, if you want a session on what are the principles for a green economy, come to this room. And we invited everyone to a room and it was packed, absolutely packed. And it demonstrated to us that people are, feel resistant to something if they are not included in its definition. Let us include people. I mean, what is an inclusive green economy? Is including you in, your, in that definition. And so we saw that there was a real energy around this principles discussion, getting people involved. If you want economic reform, what does that economy look like? Um, and so we did that one meeting, and then that meeting is expanded into a global consultation. And we've had three, 300 different organizations and individuals contribute to that from around the world. Uh, and as you, as you can see, as you can see, um, we've had, we, we ran it in Spanish, we ran it in Portuguese. So we had a good contribution from Latin America. Um, we, we had a big contribution from Europe and we had a good contribution from North America. Some of the countries where we didn't but maybe represent the fact that we didn't run it in those languages, and I think that's something we should look forward to going, going forward. Um, but lots of organizations have been involved. Um, okay, so I want to do two things with you today. First of all is that I, you go to many uh, events and people will give you some answers. Well, we, have a we don't have an answer, we have a question. Um, 
we have set in motion a very important process of inclusivity about economic def def definition. And that is the principles that, we put, that, we have um, that, that these organizations have created. The question we're asking the panel and we're asking your advice on is we have set up a very important process, but what do we do next with it? How do you take principles into implementation? How do you actually make them become steers for economic governance, measures for economic governance, um, philosophies and principles for economic governance? How do we change, how do we take those words that civil society have agreed on and make them into something that can steer the economic reform? So that's the question that we would like your assistance on because it's a genuinely open session where we want that advice. We have uh, a, a couple of leading thoughts here um, and we also want to open it up to make sure we're capturing your thoughts. So before I, draw, before I um, put that question to you, I'd like to just very briefly talk about the principles. Some of the most popular feedback we received was, again, about um, sustainable development. This is a tool to deliver it. Um, we also saw that equity was very important in this and that the economy must be informed by science and research and that green economy is not just about greenwashing. It is about directly addressing some of the bad practice. Um, now, today, very, we are launching our document which describes green economy from a civil society perspective. If you've not got a copy of this, it's in the back, or Emily and Kate and others and I can give you a copy as you leave. But in the back of this is actually the nine principles for a green economy. Um, and these are the ones not defined by, by me or by our team, but by the civil society negotiation. So they are the most authentic definition of a green economy that you will see because they've been created by 300 different civil society organizations. Um, I'd like to briefly touch on them and then to, to, us, to ask the question of how to implement. Okay, so the first principle was about this, what we call the sustain, sustainable principle. And this is really addressing the issue that this is not a replacement to sustainable development. It is a way of delivering it. Um, it is a way that addresses all dimensions of sustainable development, environmental, social, and economic, and it looks for those synergies and best practices between them, the win-win-wins, uh, and it is a vehicle to deliver sustainable development. The next principle is about the justice principle, and this was about um, how this new economy must deliver equity. It must be fair. It must respect human rights and cultural diversity. It must respect indigenous rights to land territories, and it must promote gender equality. So this is really about justice, about fairness. Um, the next thing was the dignity principle, and this is about this must be about alleviating poverty. It must be about building better livelihoods and better well-being. We don't want just an, another economy that creates lower carbon but doesn't address poverty and doesn't address the, 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 the rights of people and their, their, um, their strengths and abilities to be engaged. Um, the next principle was about healthy planet, and this was about making sure that this economy does its does its bit to look after the natural world, sees it as an important part of, um, of, of the system of economy, but also it looks after it, it invests in it, it makes sure that it doesn't take too much, it makes sure it lives within those planetary boundaries. Um, we had this very strong principle on inclusion, uh, which is about economic governance, who's involved, who makes decisions, how do those decisions define themselves, who, who, is, who is in the room, how is power shared. Uh, the next one is about accountability, this is about stakeholders being clear on who is doing what. We had a principle on resilience, which is the sense of we are trying to build resilient economies, but we're also trying to build resilient communities. We're trying to build resilient ecologies, and they are all interlinked. The stronger the resilient ecology, the stronger the community, the stronger the economy. I'm nearly there. Um, the efficiency and sufficiency principle. This is about delivering sustainable consumption and production. It's about what is enough. Life cycle management, looking after resources, social economic in innovation, um, intellectual property, all the things that bring sustainable consumption and production together and show what is enough and how do we build that efficiency and sufficiency. And the final principle was about generations, about uh, intergenerational and intergenerational, about preserving resources for the future, investing for the future, bringing um, our uh, decision making in the longer term and ensuring that our financial sector is also investing in the longer term and our decision making is in the longer term. So they were the principles um, and I, I think that process is still open. We're, we receive feedback every day on how they can be improved. 
And I think it's got to be a live process. We, we will maintain that process about what this description is of green economy principles. You are invited to contribute, to sign on. But now the question comes. We've put this long list together of what economic reform means to civil society. What sort of economy do they want to see? The question is now, how do we turn that into something that can be implemented? Something that can help steer governments and economies and actions and decisions across from community bases to businesses to governments and, and even the UN process. Um, and on that question, I'd love to bring in Professor Ladislaw and ask him about his work and, and how he thinks about how we can implement these principles so they become steers for economic reform. Ladislaw. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, I tried to bring some ideas on on what is really the, the key issue is uh, how we man manage action, how, my, how we start things uh, being done. Uh, I participated in the Rio 92 conference. I organized the, the World uh, Technology uh, Exhibit on uh, technological change and things of the kind. Uh, and uh, I think we know where we want to go. If I take these principles uh, and I look at uh, a series of parts of the uh, 21 agenda uh, in Rio and the conventions, and I look at uh, so many things we've produced before uh, on uh, basic needs and different uh, issues. Uh, I think overall, um, with adjustments, with changes in expressions in vocabulary, uh, uh, we're speaking basically about the same thing. We have to stop destroying the planet uh, for the benefit of a few, because this is what we're doing, uh, basically. Um, I think when I uh, drew up this booklet uh, called Economic Democracy, it's online, you can uh, uh, get it. I, uh, the basic idea is that the key issue is governance. How we change the decision process on the use of resources. Uh, because the decisions are simply absurd. The way we're taking them. I take my city, Sao Paulo, we have 7 million cars, average speed 14 kilometers per hour. Uh, we spend an average 2 hours 43 minutes in traffic every day. We're not working, we're not studying, we're not resting, we're not with the family. We're sitting there one behind the other. Yes, and we've just elected a mayor that is putting uh, more bridges and tunnels because if you, he thinks that if you make several stories of cars, I mean, you will solve the problem. I mean, uh, the problem is that in a very rich country and uh, elected by people who have quite a good level of education, this is a kind of people we elect. And it's very simple. I mean, uh, uh, why was he elected? He had huge money from construction companies and huge money from uh, car uh, producers. Uh, so we continue in this system. So actually, one of the key discussions we've had with Ignatius Sachs and Carlos Lopez, who is under Secretary General now, and um, in, in the document we, we produced, is that we have to uh, get back the political uh, dimension of government. Um, Hazel Henderson wrote a beautiful paper when the United States recently uh, legalized, fully legalized uh, corporate funding for uh, political candidates. Uh, she wrote on her title, the title of her paper, well, we, have, we now have the best Congress your money can buy. Um, it's as simple as that. I, I think it's a, it's a key issue on the, on the how to uh, discussion. Let, let me give a little of the, how we've worked 
around these issues uh, here in Brazil. Uh, I'm not saying Brazil is a big success, but it is a success. We've progressed very, very significantly. First of all, we decided to that some things, basic, I mean, access to food, access to basic medicine, all this, this has to be guaranteed to everybody. It's a question of human decency, not of, of economic uh, discussions or market uh, mechanism and things like that. So we gave these credit cards, you know, and they were given to women, not to men in the families. Uh, it's important to say that uh, uh, in Brazil, we had roughly 60 million people who have no postal address, uh, no bank account, uh, no, no ID. They don't exist. They didn't exist. It was a huge effort to find these people, and we, have to, we had to go through religious organizations, NGOs, etc., uh, to, uh, to get. So um, the mechanism is interesting because I think the way or the how-to problem is the, uh, for these issues will be different in different places. And in Latin America, as the key issue is inequality, if you tackle this key issue, it kind of starts a circle of different cause and consequences, then start changing the mechanism. There's an absolutely beautiful book called La Hora de la Igualdad by Cepal. Uh, for the first time since Prebish, with Alicia Barcena, we now have a very solid document taking key issues like taxes, governance, things like that, you know, uh, not shying away from discussing politics. You know. It's a kind of north for South America. You see. It's, now, these things go around in a curious way because uh, with this, we had roughly 60 million people who got into market and starting some basic consumption movement. And that stimulated very numerous local small-scale investments in poor places. And that generated jobs. And this is the, the circle that starts uh, things moving because it gave Lula's government at this beginning, a very solid political base to start more important reforms in the style of inclusive, um, of inclusion um, produtiva, inclusive production, yes, which uh, which were uh, programs like PRONAF for small-scale uh, agriculture, Territorios da Cidadania, roughly for 120 regions, more than 1,000 municipalities, and so forth. Uh, there are overall 149 social programs, which, for example, electricity for all those places where you have no access to electricity, called electricity for, uh, for everyone, and so forth. So uh, gradually, by incorporating more people in the economic process, uh, you started to effectively get more political response at the bottom of the society. You know that Lula was elected finally because uh, so many people on the right were convinced that, well, Welcome. <laughs> How was traffic? Unsustainable. Unsustainable. <laughs> so, when the crisis, the financial crisis comes, we had a very strong movement of internal market expansion. In a certain way, our major drama, which is 100 million people who are very poor in this country, can be turned around and seen as an opportunity. We have an economic horizon to expand and to pull these people into, into the process. And where they are pulled in, 
they like it. And although we had a, a, a huge attacks against Lula when he uh, was re-elected, and uh, uh, then with Dilma, things are, are working because people see that this is a way to, to, uh, to go around. So, in fact, the green economy, in our uh, uh, view here, is being pulled by the inequality program. See? Because when a great part of the consumption needs by this bottom of the pyramid, these 100 million people, they're not buying, it's not buying uh, 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 Nikes and things of the kind. It's access to education. It does not uh, have an, any impact on the climate. Yes. Uh, access to health, uh, access to culture, access to broadband, because this makes it. So you see, you have a, then we made the, the, the Pax Social, which is the social infrastructure, housing for the uh, poor part. This generates lots of jobs. It's labor intensive. Yes. And then we have, you build these houses out of the, the place where, usually they are by, by, by these rivers, they are uh, sinks in, actually, I mean, these dirty uh, rivers in, in, in towns. So you have, I'm sure, sure, I'm, what I'm trying to bring about is that the economic process, the environment process, and the social inclusive process, they go, they go together. See? One stimulates the other. And the key issue is something that is traditionally out of the bottom line, the triple bottom line, uh, social, economic, and uh, um, environmental, is that politics is central. It has to be democratic. It has to be a way that you incorporate people in the decision uh, process. And this is why I've worked on this line of economic democracy. I think democracy cannot work well just by uh, putting a paper in a, in a box every four years. I mean, you, uh, the economy itself has to be democratized. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ladislao. I, we will come back to that, but I, I kind of want to make sure that, uh, first of all, thank you very much. This is Richard Howitt, who is MEP for um, European, Commission, European Union and also the Rapporteur on Corporate Social Responsibility. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll, we'll give you a moment... Um, uh, to catch up with the debate, Richard, but thank you very much for struggling through the traffic. Um, Stephen, could I turn to you? You've seen these um, principles emerge. Um, you've seen the need for civil society to be engaged with what green economy means uh, and how these principles have, have partly been in response to their demands for inclusivity of definition. Um, so having set this train in motion of creating these principles, there is an awful lot of spotlight now on the Green Economy Coalition. We have created these things. Um, there's now an expectation of what do we now do with them? How do we now use them in our influence of government and uh, holding different stakeholders to account? So um, in, in your advice to us on how we can make sure that these principles don't just run out of steam but actually pick up pace and become something which could be, as, uh, as Ladislaw was talking about, the, a social contract, uh, economic democracy, uh, and a tool or mechanisms for helping us steer the right decisions. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Oliver, and good evening to everyone. And uh, first of all, let me start off by congratulating you for your stamina, because you're still awake. That's really good. Um, at 6.30, that's saying something, especially after days and days of intensive conversations like the one that we're having tonight. But it's really, it's really a privilege to be a part of these conversations. Um, I've been in Rio since Tuesday evening. I've been in a number of conversations like this one about, I would say, the emerging definition of the green economy um, as it's moved along. And Oliver, you've had a key role of, in this. And I think other thinkers are coming on board as well. And there's a couple of threads that I want to share with you tonight. And I'm sure that this conversation will move it forward as well. Um, 
I've had a lot of conversations over the last few months with colleagues from the ALBA countries in particular, uh, Venezuela, Ecuador, Bolivia, and those are some of the countries I think uh, that we discussed least with when we launched the Green Economy Initiative in 2008. And it's very interesting to see how that conversation emerges. Um, the Green Economy Initiative, when it was launched by Akim Steiner, our executive director, in 2008, 2009, was very much a response to rethinking the economic paradigm as a result of the crises, the financial crises, the commodity crises, uh, the fuel crises that I think you're all familiar with. Our economies tanked, and they tanked uh, for a number of reasons. One was peak oil, which we may have hit, you know, when you saw fossil fuel prices hitting $140 a barrel. Um, but they also tanked because we really took the lid off of financial markets in the 80s and 90s, and they just got ahead of themselves. So um, in the fourth quarter of 2008, and you've heard me say this a number of times, Oliver, we saw $27 trillion wiped off of capital markets. That, to me, is truly amazing. Just a quarter of the value of capital markets wiped off in, in um in a very short space of time. So a great opportunity to rethink the way we look at economic progress, economic prosperity. And when you combine that with what's happening in the, in the world today and what the science is telling us, that to me is the real shocker because the science is getting much better about telling us where we are in terms of planetary boundaries. Um, I, I believe Rockstrom was here earlier today speaking on a panel with Akim Steiner. The tipping points, I mean, we know the science is pretty clear about where we are with respect to the tipping points the carbon tipping points, the biodiversity tipping points. Um, I was speaking with Ladislav before we started, and um, two weeks ago, carbon concentrations in the Arctic Circle were recorded over 400 parts per million. We were supposed to have reached 400 parts per million in 2014. It's already been recorded. So our generation is the one that is seeing changes that may be irreversible. And that's why we need to rethink our concept of the economy and economic progress. And coming back to the principles, that's got to be at the base of all of this. And this work takes it back to the conversation with the countries uh, who are rethinking fundamentally their economic paradigms, like Bolivia and like Ecuador, um, because it goes back to the values that are driving the way we set up markets. Markets are basically social constructs. There is no free market. Markets were created to serve our needs, human needs. Markets were created to make the world a better place. But they only work when they're governed well. And I think that was one point that you were making, Ladislav, the governance, the politics. But from my point of view, it's about governing markets so they produce good outcomes. Because the markets we have today are producing lousy outcomes. They're producing lousy social outcomes, inequalities worse, across countries, between countries, and they produce lousy environmental incomes, outcomes, um, which we've seen already. So a rethinking of markets, and the governance issue to me is just so important, and that goes into the institutions, because if your institutions are not strong, the market forces will take them away. Um, and that's coming back to the conversation on the principles once again, because the principles, the values, the ethics are what is going to put the guardrails on the markets. It's what's going to shape the markets. Markets, when they work best, are defined by communities, by states, by governments to produce good outcomes. And to me, Oliver, that's where the principles need to go. They need to go into that discussion about what do we want from our markets, what do we want from our institutions, and how do we get them done? And that goes to your how-to question, Ladislav, which I think is so important. And I think there's a number of ways, but part of it is really taking control collectively of our future. Okay. And that brings me to a conversation that's happening 15 kilometers or so down the road, sometimes two hours, sometimes one hour, depending on the uh, traffic conditions. Um, which is very slow and sometimes frustrating. And I want to throw that in because what's happening there, what's being negotiated, is really the lowest common denominator of what states will accept. Whereas here, in this free-thinking environment, you can go for the highest common denominator. So that's what I would encourage you to do tonight. Think big, open it up, and let's have a real conversation about how we reshape our markets to produce 
good outcomes. Thanks, Oliver. Thank you very much. And okay, so we turn to Richard now. Richard, um, as a MEP, I, I guess you are, are making laws and uh, ways of, of governing our economies. So just because you, 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 with the traffic, you slightly missed the background to this, our principles are, have been created through a very broad global consultation with civil society that feel concerned about the environment, concerned about development, but also concerned that green economy was being defined without them being involved. Um, this was, so they wanted to say, we're, we're worried about green economy, we're worried about economic reform, we're worried about current economy. This is what we want it to deliver. So this is civil society speaking, um, 300 organizations from around the world contributed. They've come up with a list, uh, and that has created a little bit of spotlight for us on the Green Economy Coalition, because a lot of energy and effort have been put by others towards this process. Now we've got to think about, okay, we, we have a clear description of what they want economic reform to deliver. How do we then take that forward? And I guess um, civil society has spoken to a politician via us. Um, how would we work with you or other policymakers to make this something that helps govern economies? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and apologies for lateness, but I, uh, I read the principles in, uh, in advance. I'm very familiar with them, don't worry. Uh, and also, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of UNAP. I'll just say this: I, I serve with your colleague on the Global Reporting Initiative Advisory uh, Board, and more of that uh, at the end. But um, uh, a, a big fan of IIED in your coalition, uh, and I think it's fantastic that you're here. And I just will say one thing: I, I am a, I'm the sort of token policymaker here to respond as a policymaker. Though, of course, all policymakers are activists in our lives past, present and future as well. But um, one of the things I will say about that process that you've chosen to, to undertake leading up to Rio, I think you're right. right? I've, I've been here for two days. I've mainly been at the Legislators Summit that's here. And I, it started off as people saying things that everyone agrees with. And I was thinking, you know, is that are we actually advancing anything because of that? On the other hand, what we're trying to do here is to make a world-level scale change to world-level scale problems uh, with a degree of shock treatment 20 years after a previous generation. I don't know anyone in this room who was here 20 years ago. I certainly wasn't. Um, you know, had absolutely the best intentions, but both the failure to transform good ideas and agreements into practice and the fact that the world is changing and the target is, is ever moving has meant that we need to come back and do it all over again. Uh, and so, you know, as a policymaker and a legislator in a very, very crowded marketplace of ideas, of arguments, of lobbying, what is it that can give shock treatment to policymakers a global level agreement, a, a UN summit, it's the best chance. And so although I'm sure um, some of you will at some point have a degree of cynicism about all of this and feel that and look at all the weaknesses and the flaws in the system, which clearly are there, it is collectively our best chance. It's the right thing to do. And I think therefore, although some of the ideas in your principles, let's face it, for people in the environmental movement are not new, um, uh, uh, they're developed, they're, they're put forward in, in a different way. But then, you know, many of them we wouldn't call new. It is still the right thing to do. And so uh, uh, that's my first point about, as a policymaker, my response receiving all of this. I've secondly been asked to do that because there are different regions of the world in the room and on the platform to say that as a European regional legislator and policymaker. Um, where there's a sort of degree of, um, let's say, arrogance um, for a late night meeting. I could be a little bit critical, can't I, uh, of Europe. Europe feels often that we are the leader in the world on environmental issues. The truth is, hand on heart, I think sometimes we are, and I'm proud of that, because actually that is a, the result of hard work within Europe, not least hard work by 
the Green Coalition and your NGO member organisations who are perhaps strongest in Europe. So I don't see that necessarily as a, as a bad thing, although I think we have to always be a bit self-critical. Um, you know, I do think we were the leader in terms of carbon emissions, for example, um, and on many issues like water quality protection, uh, like um, uh, re renewable energy targets. You know, I think we have led the way. I think our biodiversity action plan does reflect the concept of the green economy and the communication which set the mandate for the European Commission to come here to Rio says towards the green economy and adopts the green economy as a principle. And so I think all the work that's been done by UNET and by the coalition is actually feeding through and is being heard. And I hope that encourages you. On the other hand, you know, some of you will say it, so I'll get in first to say it. You know, we at the European level haven't decoupled value creation from resource use, which is what you want us to do. We haven't yet committed ourselves to do that. I would accept that we're still at the European level talking about green growth rather than the green economy. And so we're short, you know, making oversimplifying, I suppose, and trying to ignore some of the real challenges we have before us. Although we have targets on carbon uh, and we now have targets on biodiversity, uh, we don't have targets on much else on how Europe can transform our economy and then contribute to all of the different principles that you have in your your sheet. We are still using environmentally harmful subsidies. We say that we're going to phase them out by 2020, but then we even put a condition on that in our plan. Um, but but we're, we're, uh, we're still doing all of that. And uh, Europe's common agricultural policy and common fisheries policy, although there have been reforms, uh, are still far short of, I think, what many of us within Europe, let alone outside, would suggest is the it, it would be meeting sustained the principles of sustainability so i've done a sort of scorecard mm. for europe where i think i think on development there are people from developing countries here who might well including somebody from the pacific islands last night who was really very critical of europe and he was right but i think on development i think we're pretty good so i think we 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 might pass the the, the test on the dignity principle we certainly try i think we we partly passed the test on, for example, the, the Healthy Planet principle, principle uh, four, but we need to go much, uh, much, much um, further. Uh, but I think we pretty much fail uh, the principle of achieving sustainability, principle one. And so we have to have a degree of realism, I suppose, in saying how far we've still got to go um, to meet all of that. And because I know you want an interactive debate and it's late at night, the last thing I'll say is this, uh, partly why I know you've invited me to be here. I am absolutely the champion for measurement, for saying that we can't do this unless in green accounting terms for countries and in sustainability reporting terms for companies that we really make a big move. And my presence here in Rio is essentially, it's to do lots of things, but the, my main aim is to lobby for integrated sustainability reporting for business to be part of the outcome document in paragraph 41. It's still in brackets, and I'm lobbying you like every, lobbying everyone else to get rid of those brackets. But I want to say that this isn't about just saying something that everyone agrees with, because what measures matters, or it sometimes has different, uh, slightly different formalizations, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it, is actually a very old business school management dictum. It doesn't come from the environment movement at all. It comes from management speak in the 1960s. And it actually comes from mass cost overruns in the US Department of Defense. Have I said something that someone disagrees with? Yeah, good. Right. Um, and I say that because what we're trying to do is to marry the, 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 the financial accountancy profession that for the, 90, for the 50 years since, let alone 20 years since, has been honing and honing financial accountability and accountancy. And we're trying to adapt that and to make it sustainable accountancy. 
we're quite a long way down the road. 6,000 companies are reporting with reference to the Global Reporting Initiative, which UNEP was instrumental over 10 years ago in helping to start. The International Integrated Reporting Council, which is the most jargonistic term for actually quite a sexy subject, right? IIRC, right? has been formed and all these major accountancy standard setting bodies in the world are actually part of it for the first time and they have the global aim of achieving this by 2020 and we have a coalition here at Rio of investors representing two trillion dollars of assets who uh, are campaigning for this so in Europe we've got I know you want to finish uh, a green accounting agreement that says we're at national capital at national accounting level at last we're going to mention uh, measure three things air emissions uh, material flow and environmental taxation it's very simplistic very embryonic really it's a first step but later this year we are going to have a european proposal for integrated sustainable reporting by business and we're going to try and make a step at the european level to achieve what should be <coughs> in the outcome document here and for our world. Thank you. Richard, um, that was really useful. I, I, I don't know about the rest of you, but I, I really liked um, to hear a policymaker go through and say, we don't quite meet that one, we meet that one, we meet that one, we don't meet that one. Um, because this is exactly what I want to turn the audience to here. You know, let's imagine that this, this principles process continues to strengthen with organizations, civil society organizations buying into this, contributing, continuing to improve it. Are we actually starting to develop some sort of scorecard that you're holding governments to account on? And the interesting thing about measure what matters is that there seems to be three agendas that, um, that are on the Rio agenda. First of all is the sustainable development goals, which is the global community. Are we holding the global community to account on sustainability, justice, dignity, healthy planet? You know, what are the measures that actually the sustainable development goals may want to track for our new social contract for economic reform? And then you, you talked about the European Commission, and I guess that's kind of the national regional level. And one of the discussions that's on the agenda here again is the beyond GDP debate. What is the measure? But we're saying is the beyond GDP debate. Is it about inclusivity? Is it about dignity? Is it about justice? And where are those measures? And then you mentioned the corporate reporting. I and mean, what's the contributors, contribution and all of those? So I'm starting to get two things from this. This idea of holding people to account against some key, key themes. But then there's another point, which is what are the measures or indicators that tell us whether something is equitable or not equitable, just or not just? So that's kind of where I'm at. Um, and I, I'd like to throw this open for um, your points and your ideas on how we make these principles into this social contract where we can hold this agenda to debate. Uh, yeah. So I'll come to you in a second, Stephen. Yes, sir. hi there. If you could just say who you, we have a rogue mic. Uh, we do. There's some. Yeah. We do have some roving mics. Thank you. Say who you are, where you're from, and your point. Thank you very much. Hello. Hi. Uh, I'm uh, Karina Millstone from the New Economics Institute in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, thank you very much for this interesting conversation. Um, I really have uh, two questions for Richard. Uh, two things you said that I made a note of. The first one was um, when you were being harsh on yourself. You said we haven't decoupled growth from resource use. Um, that's not that surprising to me personally, because I'm, I'm not sure that's possible. Uh, my question for you on that, do, I mean, do you believe we could get to a situation on where we do decouple growth and resource use? Uh, the second point you said that I jot, jotted down was, we've been talking about green growth rather than the green economy. I was interested that you, you saw a distinction between green growth uh, and the green economy making me wonder whether you thought green growth was just growth in so-called green sectors or whether this meant you envisaged the green economy as being more of a steady state economy. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. We'll just take a few. So I know that Steve had his hand up. Oh, thanks. Um, this is about the issue of what you do with principles. I don't think it's quite a... a um, a choice between holding people to account 
or the boring thing that people usually do, which is write plans. I think we certainly don't want to take those principles and now sort of write national plans on them because they will be um, content free. I think there's a step before you uh, hold people to account, and that is that you use these principles as a kind of test of all the good stuff that we have already. So you use it as a test for government regimes, for market regimes, for the principles investors use, for corporate reporting. A test in the sense of uh, an exercise regime, stretching them a little more. Because some of these uh, market regimes, certification standards, some of them are pretty good in some of these areas. But the, they all need stretching. So it's like we need a period, almost a sort of amnesty, where we all say we'll pick up this exercise regime, test ourselves against it, and see where we can stretch. That's the sort of technical aspect. I think there is another aspect, though, that this has to go very, very, very public, so that the, the ordinary person in the street starts to pick up this is what I expect from my government, this is what I expect from my corporation. So when you open the newspapers, what, the thing that changes every day is the stock exchange prices, uh, weather, sometimes the cost of a shopping basket. Maybe we can start to introduce slightly different things, you know, stock exchange plus one or two of these principles, the cost of the shopping basket plus footprint. And in that sense, I think ultimately it's the public who will push for accountability, no, no one in this room. So exercise regime and make this attractive and public. And congratulations on that little book, by the way. I think that's sort of semi-public, a bit wonky, but semi-public. Thank you very much, Steve. We try to bridge the gap between wonk and public. Um, I think there was a hand up over there. Uh, Sorry. Tinha aqui. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Hello. Eu vou fazer em português. Posso fazer em português a pergunta? É, eu queria levantar duas questões é, sobre a importância das políticas públicas nessa mudança de padrão em transição para sustentabilidade. No mundo em que os estados têm muito menor poder econômico do que as corporações. E uma coisa que me interessou muito no que ele falou sobre esses novos padrões de contabilidade. Porque essa crise que ocorreu, entre aspas, que eu vejo em 2008, foi uma crise já que foi uma consequência de uma contabilidade torta, em que o mercado diz quanto vale uma empresa é, em cima de, de padrões é, de cálculo completamente irreais, fictícios que não corresponde efetivamente ao real valor. Então, eu queria que ele esclarecesse um pouco mais essa, essa visão de uma nova contabilidade, porque é uma visão bastante interessante. Ok, então, nós temos algumas recomendações, uma pergunta sobre decoupling. Uh, Richard, eu acho que foi apontado a você, a diferença entre a economia verde e a economia verde. Green growth. Uh, some comments from Steve on exercise regime. Maybe, maybe we, uh, Stephen, I don't know, you might be able to pick that up. And also this idea of bringing it to the public. Um, maybe, maybe we could all think about that one. Um, and then this further questions about measurement and how to bring the accountability. Did you get that question as well, Richard? And, okay. So if I could start with you, Richard, maybe you could address. Ah, oh, thank you. And, well, hello there. We also, the traffic. <laughs> hello. Hello, Joby. So Joby, Joby is from um, the Global Compact. And for those of you who don't know the Global Compact, the UN have, you know, it's, it's their, their big, very successful attempt to reach out to business. And uh, they have, I think, over 8,000 businesses now, Joby? So 8,000 businesses. Good, I did my stats. 8,000 businesses which are now uh, actively engaged. And they actually have that run on 10 principles which underpin the Global Compact's work. So they've actually described 10 principles, and they, all businesses are engaged on those 10 principles. Uh, so, Joby, I, thank you very much for struggling on through the traffic. I, I spoke 
had an email from you about a quarter an hour before it started, and you were still an hour and a half away, so you've done brilliantly. Thank you so much. Um, so the question that we've been asking is, we have these principles that the Green Economy Coalition has helped create. How are we going to implement them? Um, there's a couple of questions that have come from the audience, so maybe we could um, just respond to those questions, and then we could ask Joby to give her experience and advice to us as the Green Economy Coalition about how to really engage business with um, principles and uh, what she would recommend to us. So I'll come to you in a second, Joby, but we'll just uh, answer the questions that have already been asked. Thank you. Richard. Just on the, uh, our colleague for, from Boston, I actually think that there are better people probably on this panel and in this room who've really researched and thought about these things deeply. But I think it's a good question to put to a policymaker because in the end we have to justify our actions or our non-actions. I won't dodge it, but I'd be interested if anyone else uh, also comments. On, on the decoupling issue, as, a, as, a, as an elected politician, if I have to go back to my electorate and say you have to have less growth, less prosperity, less development in order to uh, enable us collectively to have successful environmental sustainability goals, which I accept there are some political parties do do put that view and may well be represented in the room, but the, the, the main political parties, certainly in Europe, wouldn't, wouldn't take that view. It's, it's, it's a, a recipe for being kicked out of office and not being re-elected. Some would say that leads us to dishonest policy making. People will make their own choices about that. But I think uh, to the degree that it's honest policy making, it's about saying we have to find a way where we can increasingly meet human development needs without prejudicing uh, the environmental sustainability of our planet. We have to do that. And in, in essence, uh, that's what we're going to be talking about in the next whole week, not just this evening, about the marriage of those two uh, objectives. And then my point about the green growth versus the green economy is very much what coalition members are saying back to me and to us in Europe. Um, that we are treating it too much as a sectoral, you know, let's do lots of good renewable energy things and build wind tur turbines rather than really being thinking hard enough about transforming all industry, all the, of the economy towards low carbon and other environmentally sustainable growth. And I think there's some truth in it. Uh, and that's a neat way of, you know, I suppose, comprising at the very least the challenge. I'll jump over the points that you want to, the, the, to put to Stephen, except I just will say this. I loved reading words in your principles like justice, dignity, inclusion that we do use in other realms but often don't get used in an environmental debate. And I think that's a very important thing that attracts me when, uh, in, the, in, in these principles. And so I do identify with this point about not turning them into boring action plans that won't actually make a difference. I think val the, the way that you've based this on values is really good. And I, I hope you keep this, the spirit of that as you take it forward. And finally, on this accountability, uh, to two colleagues, particularly to our Brazilian colleague, the only thing I would say to you is, um, the, well, to both of you, the public won't push for something that they don't know about. Accountability comes with information, transparency, as we policymakers use. And that's why I'm putting such emphasis on the reporting issue. Because, uh, yes, the market, consumers, new recruits, investors, and NGOs can hold policymakers, governments, companies to account. But you can't do it unless the information is there. And that's why I see this as absolutely crucial at this stage in history. Stephen. Yeah, thanks. Um, some really good questions. I want to come back to the first one from Karin. Uh, Karina at the New Economics Institute. Because behind your question, I think there's also a premise that I'd like to tease out a bit. Um, I mean, can we decouple growth from resource use? I don't think we have much alternative, personally, um, because if we don't start creating value, ooh, that was a uh, big shift there. And, uh, if we don't start creating value, 
um, without reducing material throughput, then we're on a clear path for unsustainability. But I am also curious, that's really strong, who's ever controlling the uh, volumes there. Um, you know, Kenneth Boulding and others, other thinkers thought a lot about steady state economics, um, Herman Daly as well, and they struggled within the establishment to give credibility to these issues. And um, I think they're on to something, but I also feel that as human beings, and this goes back to my sociology roots, we need to feel that there's a future, that there's an optimism, that there's a space that we can grow into. And that's somehow where the growth comes in as well, from my point of view. Um, so I don't think growth is necessarily wrong. I think it's the way we grow. Um, I wanted to say also a short plug here. We're working with um, the World Bank, the OECD, and others on something called the Green Growth Knowledge Platform to look at ways that you can decouple growth and make it greener um, within planetary boundaries. On the issue of uh, principles that uh, Steve Bass mentioned, you know, I think the work you've done on the principles, Oliver, is extraordinary because you've tapped into something which is that green economy landed almost from outer space in some ways, you know, on the neo agenda. And I'm still learning about how it landed because I've been at UNEP for two years. So before that, I, I wasn't part of the green economy initiative whatsoever. But by being on the Rio agenda, all of a sudden, everyone had to figure out what this is. And many people had no idea who's Pierce, who's uh, Anil Marcantia, who's uh, Ed Barbier. They never heard of the work on resource economics before, so all this was kind of new. Um, and I think that's where the struggle is to still define it and include people in that definition. But measurements will be key. And I've seen some really interesting work out there. Um, there's actually a green economy index. And something I've been toying with for a long time is um, doing something which would say, how green is your economy? Can you actually measure that? I know there's so much resistance to it right now because people don't want to be measured. Countries don't want to be measured within the context of Rio. But I would find that fascinating. And then what would those measurements be? Now, the OECD has really struggled with this. And for those of you who followed their headline indicators, gotten into a lot of trouble trying to develop some core indicators around this. But to me, I think there's a huge amount of work that needs to go into this. And I find it fascinating to measure against the principles with the inclusion dimension as well. Thank you, Stephen. I, I, uh, I must admit, the campaigner within me wants to benchmark countries and top 10 um, on what's doing what on inclusivity and sustainability and justice and healthy planet. Um, but the more inclusive part of me says um, there are different ways of engaging organizations in principles constructively as a learning platform and as a way to stretch and improve. And um, Joby, if I could come to you. You've struggled through the traffic, so we thank you. We should give you some a decent airing. Um, your experience with principles and the Global Compact is, is really, really probably probably the most advanced global organization that has driven principles through behavior. So I think you're, uh, we, we'd love to hear your advice on um, using or thinking about how we would engage business and others on our principles. What are the things you learn? How do, how, do you, how do you drive behavior change? How do you make sure people are buying into it? What happens if they don't? Can you kick them out? Um, you know, can you encourage them to be involved? I mean, how do, why do they get involved in the first place? You know, all of those questions, everything that you have to download for us on principles and behavior change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for this opportunity. Um, and I bring you greetings from my boss, uh, Executive Director Georg. Um, I uh, also want to congratulate you on the principles that uh, they have really unpacked what green economy means to people. Um, and that, that these are the issues that the Global Compact cares about. How do we engage companies? It, uh, I mean, why do companies engage with the Global Compact? There are different reasons. Some engage for sure, just to show that they engage with the UN. Some engage because they're already doing this. Some engage because they want to learn. It's, there are different types of uh, companies, and they engage for different reasons. And how do we, I mean, as you, you will, uh, some of you know, we have 10 principles in the area of human rights, environment, labor issues, and on anti-corruption. And what do we ask companies to do? We ask them, to, number one, to change organizationally. There has to be organizational change because you cannot give to others 
what you don't have. So you need to change your own system. You need to engage your staff. You need to train them on the principles in terms of all our 10 principles. And once you do that, um, we have a, what we call a management model where we tell companies, you need, for example, you need to access, as a, in the area of anti-corruption, assess your risks. What are your risks? Do something about your risks. How do you do something about your risks? Um, you need to map it out. You need now from there, uh, you need to have policies in place to deal with such risks that you have identified. Implement them. Uh, report. I mean, then um, uh, we have indicators for them to measure in terms of implementing, and then also to report. And then we go back again to uh, to uh, assessing and coming back. So that's the management model in terms of organization and change. You, once you change in-house, now need to engage in collective action, engage with other companies outside there, work together. These are issues of, uh, these challenges are not what one company can address. We need to address them collectively. And for example, in my country, I'm from Nigeria, corruption is a huge issue in my country. One company cannot fight corruption alone. Therefore, we need to come together, a coalition of companies that want to do good in terms of uh, wanting to uh, fight corruption. And then we also make sure that we engage with investors. They need to push, they need to make sure that these issues are investment decisions for them to be able to engage a company. We also work with governments, making sure that you know, they hear the voice of companies in terms of uh, uh, addressing these issues in their countries. Um, there's so many others because of time I really don't want to go, but one thing I want to stress here is that implementation is not easy. That's what we've seen within uh, with our companies. We have to spoon feed some of them. For example, we have to develop tools and resources. We have to uh, ensure that they train, for example. We have to ensure that they report to us through our communication on progress. If they don't report, then we delist them. So we have that sort of in quote, enforcement mechanism. Despite all of this, we, are, we have about 8,000 companies. Only very few of them do implement. It's a big challenge for us also. But uh, from where we started from and from where we are now, implementing, you know, implementation is getting better and better. But as we can see from our um, implementation survey that we uh, there was a press release about uh, four days ago where we released our uh, implementation survey. How far our companies have implemented the global compact? The result is still very low, depending also on the principles when it comes to anti corruption. It's low, human rights is low, environment, they do implement because it does hit the bottom line. And when it comes to others, it's very difficult for them to implement. I, I, I'm really interested um, to see if the out of the Rio process comes the Sustainable Development Goals. Will this change your principles? Will you will you think about adopting those goals as how they might be articulated into principles of your global compact? Or is uh, we believe that um, even if the goals are there, you know what we do in terms of, for example, the, the MDGs, we. Uh, work with, it's one of our goals. Apart from our principles, we have two goals also that we work in partnership with companies are also for them to be able to implement the MDGs. That is what we are going to do also. And that's what we are also advocating. We want the SDGs and we are going to also make sure that our companies um, scale up and you know address these issues uh, holistically. Thank you. Uh, can we throw it open to the audience again? Um, this question of implementing principles about measurement, about driving economic governance. Um, oh, John. Another coalition member. Good evening, I'm John Montelay. I work for Forest Stewardship Council, indeed also a member of the coalition. Um, I heard some people saying that we need to work further on the principles and so on. I would suggest not to do that. <laughs> I would suggest really to focus as a coalition on, on the green economy implementation because only if we go from the theory to practical steps we can also address and maybe mobilize decision makers, uh, 
organizations that really matter in society, like trade unions and uh, industry and so on. And uh, I, I think in particular the coalition should then look at focus on the barriers. Why is it not obvious that the green economy is, 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 is marching on? And uh, I don't think we have to just only look at the discussions here in the Rio conference where it's of course awful how it's being discussed about the green economy, where it is not so much, I think, like Stephen said, um, go, moving to the lowest common denominator, but it's here about 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 the developing countries uh, speaking about broken promises and thinking that the green economy comes with a new bill and that they are wondering who's going to pay the bill and the developed countries no, no longer accepting that all the green uh, developing countries are poor and that they are should also start uh, sharing some responsibility at least part of them. So I, I think we have to go for then. Th this is, I guess, the, the worst place probably to discuss what the green economy is because it's so much so much determined by these kind of ideological uh, battles. And let's look at the some of the principles that are really implementing principles like internalization of external costs. <clears throat> I think that's a key issue, <clears throat> the fundamental of, of of a green economy, subsidies and fiscal reform. And I think we. As, okay, we have a lot of trouble already doing it in the developed countries, but I have learned the last year in the discussions I was that in the developing countries it can even be much more complicated. There is this, the issue of that a lot of subsidies really have a social function. And I think this example of, of credit cards in Brazil, I think is an excellent example of how you can get out of it. You remove this perverse impact of subsidies by for everybody in the market. Subsidies make uh, fossil fuels so artificially cheap for everybody in the market. Also those that can afford a higher price. If you increase the prices and you start with such a system like credit cards, you make sure that the poor people still have access to that share that they really need for as basic needs. And for the rest, the, the market is really going to determine uh, that people are uh, investing in energy efficiency and so on. So this kind of very practical things, how to, how to uh, remove subsidies without a negative social impact by bringing this kind of very innovative uh, ideas. Another is, and I think also in the Green Economy Coalition, we have not discussed this very much, the power that public authorities have through their uh, public procurement. 20% of all the purchase in the world is done by public authorities. They can trigger innovation. They can trigger uh, local economies uh, by, uh, set, <clears throat> by changing this just from lo always looking for the lowest price, but looking for added value with the public purchase examples. And again, in Brazil, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I heard that, for example, in Brazil, uh, schools are obliged when they buy food for the pupils that are eating at school, at least 30% has to come from uh, local family farmers. That's correct. You know, I think this is a, a fantastic uh, initiative to, to use your public uh, money to do something very specific which has sustainability and a social agenda. I think this kind of things are, are really the things we, we should look, like, look at at the at coalition. Thank you, John. Um, Melissa, uh, you might want a microphone, I don't know, unless you project. Translation. Um, another suggestion about these principles. Um, I think the booklet is fantastic, and yet it rightly raises some critical questions about how things will move forward. And I wonder if one of the things that could be done is to look for examples of good and less good practice where these principles may be being violated and stop them in their tracks, as it were. The particular area I'm thinking about, I'm delighted that the booklet raises it, is in the chapter about natural resource evaluation, where I think we're already seeing examples of... Um, as it were, the commoditization of nature and new markets for ecosystem services and carbon and so on, becoming associated with green grabs that are working very much against the principles that you outline around justice and inclusion. And this, this is one area where, as it were, the green economy has a dark side that if it proceeds untrammeled could actually unravel a lot of the very positive progress that's being made around valuing natural resources. 
Um, so I think we need badly to draw attention to examples where things are already beginning to, or risk going a little bit wrong, um, as well as examples of where those, uh, and actually show how applying the, the nine principles can actually keep things on the right track. Okay. Thank you, Melissa. Um, panel, we have some um, specific comments about subsidy reform, taxation reform, credit cards, innovative instruments that really can start to bring the principles to life from John. Um, and from Melissa, we have this idea of demonstrating uh, how a green economy needs to be kept pure by addressing and keeping these principles in mind in, in some of the developments that it's underway. Uh, Stephen, can I come to you? Have you some points to make on that? Okay, I'd love to. Um, I'd like to engage with you after this as well to understand a bit more your perception about the dark side of the green economy. Because to me, if the institutions are strong and the governance is strong, then the economy will produce good results um, regardless of its color. Um, and so I know there are some, some concerns about concentrating wealth, but anyway, perhaps we could explore that a bit more afterwards. I wanted to go to the first question that John raised. It's a little bit philosophical, but I found it very exciting because um, you mentioned something about it's a bad time to be negotiating this. And it is a bad time because we have a financial crisis from 2008 that's gone on for four or five years. I've heard it called the Great Recession as opposed to the Great Depression. And it's a jobless recovery. And basically what it is is that high-income countries have been living beyond their means for the past 30 or 40 years. And now these countries are basically debtor countries, right? The developed world is a developing world, or it's an undeveloping world in some regards. And this is a very interesting angle to the negotiations, because when I was in the negotiating session on green economy, at some point the G77 picked up this concept of unsustainable patterns of consumption and production. And they said, you know, if we're going to talk about a green economy, we need to talk about footprint. And we need to talk about unsustainable patterns of consumption and production. And that asymmetrical deadlock that's been the negotiating story for the past six months about Europe against the G77 all of a sudden melted because Europe said, you know what, you're right. We have a lot to do in terms of our unsustainable consumption and production. And that was, to me, a huge breakthrough. And I hope that it keeps moving forward. One last point on the principles. Use them to stop things that are not working but use them to celebrate success because there is success around the world. There are really interesting examples of what's going on in business and in governments. So I would say absolutely don't tinker with them too much more, in my view. I mean, get them out, but use them in an applied way. One last thing, Oliver, which is a question. In the other direction from here is the People's Summit. Now, interestingly, tonight, um, Akim Steiner actually went to the People's Summit. He addressed the People's Summit at 6 o'clock tonight. I was really torn because I wanted to hear that. I wanted to hear the interaction. Um, how do you take these principles to the People's Summit? How do you start to massify them so that you build and include them and, in a way, tap into that energy that I feel is so tangible of dissatisfaction with the, stat the status quo? How do we actually take these principles and give them the force of the discontent that could serve to reshape markets and reform the economy? Thank you, Stephen. Um, I mean, really, they grew from discontent, so uh, we, we, we probably need to keep it in that space. Um, thank you. Ladislav, we haven't heard from you in a while, so please. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to put things both on a wider uh, view and uh, and more practical view. Uh, how did we uh, abandon slavery? Uh, remember that it was considered quite normal not so long ago. Colonialism, having countries, having masters in whole continents was considered normal in the generation of our fathers. I mean, uh, how did this cultural change, come up. it was a major shift, a deep shift. It did come around. When I take the basic figures now, we have four billion dollars, for, sorry, four, four billion people, uh, according to the World Bank report, the next four billion, 
uh, they don't say they're poor or things like that. They, 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 they are very elegant. They say they do not have access to the uh, benef uh, benefits of globalization. Uh, it's a nice way to, to say it. Um, but this is it. I mean, we have 4 billion people out. And what's more, it's not just the Arabs who are uh, uh, angry about it. I mean, uh, the Aymaras in Bolivia, they, they, they don't say uh, yes, sir, anymore. I mean, nobody is, you know, we don't have the poor as, as we had them sometimes. Yes. Everybody throughout the world want uh, health and uh, decent education for their children. And all this. So, so the pressure is, 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 is mounting. And uh, what is at least my experience, I've worked seven years in Africa trying to put uh, 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 policies on, uh, I belong to a generation where we, we were expelled by the military here. We have 20 years of dictatorship. So I had, uh, they gave me opportunity to, to, to get in touch with different experiences. In, in, uh, and I had to go down from uh, my different uh, economic studies to practical things that work, you see. And I think there's, there's lots of things to be learned in what's happening in Latin America now. I mentioned the La Hora de la Igualdad document. It's an extremely important document. And some practical things like, for example, we say growth or no growth, but what is growing? If you take the US, less than 10% of workers work in industry, all industrial sectors together. Agriculture, much less. What is growing? What is the main economic sector in the US is health, 17% of GDP, and growing. If you put together health, education, culture, security, not uh, the army, but I mean, internal, all these things, you're at least at the level of 40% of GDP. And this kind of growth uh, does not create problems of climate uh, change. So actually, we can have growth. In countries which have reduced the, the hours of working, you have a, a stimulus for cultural activities. You're shifting growth to another kind. So it's not a kind of, of thing of going to your community and saying we have to, to uh, reduce our consumption, things like that. People don't need more Nikes and, and, and more uh, uh, things, of, uh, things of the kind. So it's a shift in what we're producing. And these new kinds of, of production, they need much more public consumption. Uh, to produce uh, ed educational health, you don't bring it in containers from China. They have to be local. And as they are local, they structure the people around their needs. Because to make health work, it's not just, you know, production. It's a way a society gets organized in every town, every in local things. So, in, when I when I speak of the the 149 programs in Brazil that I have analyzed, because people only speak of the Bolsa Família, and this is because it's in the paper, but it's a whole set of programs actually bringing the people from down below. It generates another. Uh, uh, political attitude, and it generates strength for continuity. This is why, for me, it's so important, not just to have the credit card for, for, the, uh, uh, for the families to have the money. This is one thing. Uh, to get the money, they have to keep their, their kids in school, and to, they have to have them vaccinated, and, and, and this forces the schools to organize their statistics. Uh, so, in fact, you generate structuring uh, active, socially structured activities that change the, the process. I would, just to mention the key issue of, uh, of information. What we're working on is a cultural change. It's not economic change. And uh, if we have information only on stock market and, uh, uh, and the weather and, and so forth, uh, uh, forget it. So we are all very informed people here, but there's a huge gap between our level on discussion and the rubbish we get on TV on the different uh, systems of communications uh, uh, we have. We, just like with the slavery problem, with colonialism problem, until you get a huge 
cultural change at the bottom of society. Let me just give you one uh, example. You know Vali do Rio Dossi, uh, uh, you but certainly. Vali do Rio Dossi is one of the, the, the 10 biggest uh, corporations uh, uh, worldwide. I had a meeting with them. Uh, it's a Brazilian company. Um, they tell me, we manage with some very simple measures to reduce 70% of our water consumption. Considering what they are, they're speaking of tens of millions of uh, 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 cubic meters of water. Marvelous. Then I thought, I mean, if it was enough to, to have a few simple measures, why did they have to wait so long? So you understand my point? Until you have pressure from society for things to change, these corporations, you know, they, they navigate on uh, uh, calm waters, yes, and they say things are, uh, uh, things are good. I mean, the happy days are back. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sam. I think this idea of um, public success, public engagement, ensuring that we see this as a cultural change. I mean, it's one of the things that I think is important of these nine principles is that we've engaged people who don't have economic backgrounds and they have expressed what culturally they want an economy to do for them. So I, I, I'm absolutely clear that, you know, that, uh, and that it, it really is about bringing different worlds together. And, and uh, certainly Richard mentioned that he liked the use of justice and dignity, healthy. You know, these are words that, that describe a culture as well as an economy. Uh, I would like to, we're getting very close to the end. I, I'd like to just give the opportunity for any final closing comments, um, starting with Joby, and then we'll just go along the panel. And if there are just one, one key, <coughs> key point that you want us to take away, that would be most useful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I just want to say that um, these issues are, I mean, cannot be addressed by one sector of the society and that um, the private sector is key if you, uh, for this to succeed. They have a lot, of, I mean, to, a lot of power, a lot of resources, and to whom there is a lot of power, there has to be a lot of responsibility. And uh, for my engagement, I mean, for my work and engagement with the private sector within the Global Compact, some of them are very serious in addressing these issues. I just came from a session where we were addressing addressing biodiversity ecosystem. And a number of companies came to show what they're doing there. So these are issues that a number of them are pertinent about, and I'm sure they will, uh, they would like to, I mean, it is, um, that it is important to engage them uh, in the implementation of uh, uh, these principles. And I believe that uh, the Global Compact will work with you and uh, uh, in the, I mean, in getting the private sector engaged and that um, um, we need also constructive engagement with the private sector. Uh, we do not need to continue to tell them that they are the bad ones and also they want to work with, uh, with others um, on, on the same, uh, on a level playing field as partners and not seen as um, the devil and most importantly also that government to create an enabling environment. We can say that we want to do this, want to do that, unless we have will of governments. It's, it's not going to be done. So the will of governments is very important. Thank you. Thank you, Joby. Richard, can I come to you? Uh, I'll just say very briefly to John on subsidies. You know, th there has to be a reality check, not just at this meeting, but in Rio. I sit in an awful lot of meetings in Brussels, which is all about getting rid of subsidies and not at all about introducing transfers. You know, it's just about market efficiency in plain terms. We had the Financial Reporting Council that's in charge of accountancy in my own country. You know, a whole meeting about the banking crisis and transparency, nothing at all about sustainability till I chip in. So it's very, very important to, to not mislead ourselves that we're winning these arguments. We've got a long way to go. On procurement, we can't yet get targets out of the European Union. It's lovely policies, but not actually percentages and timescales. We haven't got that. Uh, and, on, and on Melissa's point about green grabs, you know, the, the, the emissions trading scheme from Europe is a damn good idea. It's absolutely the right thing to do. 
but we've been giving away the permits willy-nilly and we've been completely underpricing them to the degree that hopefully it will work in the end which is what we're all working towards but there is a danger that it's fatally undermined in the meanwhile and that the whole system breaks up so i think we have to have a reality check but i want to say a positive thing not a negative thing in conclusion uh, and it does reflect you know i work with the global compact and that certainly uh, deeply respect what it's doing uh, and you know some people criticize it because in a way it's the simplest and most straightforward of this vast number of different sets of guidelines and principles and codes that are out there but it's great merit is that it's so high profile with the personal authority of the secretary general of the un that it gets people in that wouldn't otherwise be got in and it's developed over time as well uh, with the communications in progress uh, actually getting rid of some companies which it never would have done in the first place and then some companies evolve having gone to the global compact they then take that and they then go for themselves further down the line because they choose to do it and, and so I say all of that because your question about the, the green economy principles it doesn't matter actually if you know the it's principle one or principle two or it's this document or that document you've also contributed to what matters is that people are involved in a process that really changes their mindset and then leads to a change of behavior right that's what matters and whether it's that one or that one or that one is less important than it is happening because it is a process and it's not one that we can get at in a short term and therefore i believe that uh, you know this approach that you're advocating is the right approach don't get hung up or it's got to be this one right recognize that a values principles based approach is the right way to genuinely get the behavioral change that you want let me suggest the, an attitude. Look at where are the opportunities. Uh, take the example of the Green Transition Scoreboard Hazel Henderson has been working on. Uh, you know, we have a financial crisis, so the pension funds uh, are discovering that their guarantee are bonds that are rather junky. Uh, so they're running off uh, to... Uh, new uh, energy alternatives, construction, green construction alternatives, and so forth. So uh, 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 they calculated that in these uh, last five years, there are $3.3 trillion who have moved from junk papers to green investment. That's an opportunity. Uh, uh, the paper is on my website. It is on ethical markets. The, the stat, it's very interesting. You know, uh, people are... Uh, want to feel more secure of where they're putting uh, uh, putting uh, their money. Uh, let me uh, mention the huge opportunities that local development uh, represents. We've been working with the cities of Sao Paulo and other cities in Latin America, and you have examples in the United States, take Jacksonville and so many other, where people say, well, uh, until the world starts moving in green ways, etc., etc., we in our city will We'll make our homework. We'll make a decent living. We'll make sure that uh, uh, we are sustainable and so forth. We have the access to, uh, to knowledge. Knowledge can circulate, can be. See? So there are uh, important avenues uh, uh, for change. We made, a, we made a paper called uh, Crisis and Opportunities with uh, Carlos Lopez and Ignacy Sachs. I invite you to have a look at my website. You just put Ladislao Dober. It's on the and then you're on my website. Um, Thank you, you have this paper there in English. Thank you very much. And Alex. in Portuguese. Thank you, Larissa. Stephen, any last thoughts from you? Thanks, Oliver. Um, two last thoughts. One is, um, let us question our faith in markets, um, but let us question the institutions behind the markets. And I'll leave you with one last example. Um, LIBOR. How many of you are familiar with LIBOR? It's the London Interbank rate. It controls $350 trillion worth of, of assets around the world. How many of you know there's actually an investigation going on about fixing LIBOR between the main banks? This is supposedly the rate for market clearing around the world. 
and it's three or four times the total value of the economy. So markets are what we make them. Let us not demonize markets. Let us control markets. Let us put the institutions there that will ensure good outcomes. Oliver, for you, my, my kudos, because I think you've done an excellent job of taking this dialogue forward. I think you've done a really good job of engaging people and ideas and uh, bringing in conflicting ideas and widening the debate. And I think that's where I would suggest you take this. And in particular, again, to the People's Summit. I mean, just a few kilometers or miles down the road, there is a raging debate about what is post-capitalism, what is, what is the economy to deliver. Your conference is scheduled to end in two minutes. You and the coalition to think about how do you take this and really create a wave <coughs> that goes beyond do what you do so well, which is engage in a fierce debate about how to move this forward. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Ursula. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Joby. Um, it's been a, um, a very useful session for us. We wanted this session really to inform us because it's a genuinely, we have set a, a big a big precedent of demand for these principles but also well what next so we've got some very good ideas of stress testing of developing a public involvement awareness engaging other organizations the the disquiet that is around uh, getting that sense of an exercise regi regime I like the idea I think that Melissa put forward about telling some good stories and some bad stories how these principles are coming Your to life. Your conference is scheduled um, to end in two minutes. <laughs> and our conference must end. The uh, big brother have spoken. Um, so uh, I, I would like to thank you all very much for being with us this afternoon. This process is not over. Um, if you would like to be engaged with the principles process, if you have your own thoughts on what are the measures that bring these things to life, uh, where are the discussions going that we need to engage with? Does your organization want to be part of this movement going forward? We are welcome and open, as we will, we will be. Um, this is about inclusivity and growth of ideas and sharing and that cultural change. Now, that's the thing that I think that I'd like to think about some more, particularly like that idea of cultural change and cultural ownership of an Your Janet video conference has now finished. Goodbye. Needs to do what we need. And that is to look after the natural world and bring us well-being.